One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Because you see, John Tanner, he actually believed that staying inside is what caused his illness. He was used to sleeping outside, being one with nature, getting all that oxygen, getting that breathing in that good air. And by living indoors, that was the reason he would get sick a lot. So he thought that indoor living is what caused his sickness. Simon Gertie, the notorious renegade, had actually talked to Simon Kitten, who is actually more of a notorious frontiersman than Daniel Boone. The night before he deflected, so Simon Kitten talked to Simon Gertie, or Simon Gertie talked to Simon Kitten the night before he deflected in 1778, just after Edward Hand's ridiculous and disastrous squall campaign. Hello? Hello, is this thing on? Hello? Who is it? Is this thing on? Let's rewind one score and two years ago. On September 8th, 1756, British Admiral William Armstrong attacked Kittening. Kittening. Kittening is the current city of Armstrong County in Pennsylvania, and it's 44 miles northeast of Pittsburgh. And William Armstrong attacked Kittening, and that allowed Thomas Gertie, the eldest of Simon Gertie's brothers to be rescued and liberated. Thomas Gertie had been captive for 40 days. But that was good for Thomas Gertie. It wasn't good for James Gertie, George Gertie, and Simon Gertie. James, George, and Simon were not so fortunate. Ten-year-old George Gertie was adopted into a Lenape tribe. Thirteen-year-old James Gertie was adopted into a Shawnee tribe as were Simon Gertie's biological mother, Mary Newton, and his baby stepbrother, John Turner. Fifteen-year-old Simon Gertie was taken by Western Senecas to a village near Lake Erie's East Shore, where he was adopted into the Iroquois League and trained as an interpreter. Fifteen-year-old Simon Gertie was given to Gaiasuda, the chief of the Ohio Seneca, a.k.a. the Mingos. And again, he lived in a village near Lake Erie's East Shore in northwestern Pennsylvania. And then Simon Gertie lived with the Seneca for seven years. So for seven years, he did as the Seneca done. He ate like them. He dressed like them. He behaved, lived, acted like the Seneca. He was Gaius Sutos in Gaius Suta's tribe. So therefore, he would take on the characteristics of Gaius Suta himself in the Seneca, uh, the Iroquois Seneca, the Mingo, the Ohio Seneca, the Ohio Mingo characteristics uh, himself. He, they would become internalized, okay? Seven years, seven years, Simon Gertie, he was able to learn 11 languages. And so he was there. He was there for seven years during his prime when he went from boyhood to manhood with the Seneca. But all that comes to an end. On October 17th, 1764, British commander Henry Bouquet demanded that the Ohio Indians, the Native Americans, return their captives, including those not yet returned from the French and Indian War. Chief Gaiasuta and other Native leaders reluctantly handed over more than 200 captives many of whom had been adopted into the Native American families. On November 14, 1764, Simon Gertie returned to the British after a prisoner exchange, and he resurfaced near Fort Pitt. Simon Gertie, of Scots-Irish descent, knew 11 languages now. He had become fully assimilated with the Seneca, and he preferred their way of life. In 1765, Henry Louis Bouquet was promoted to Brigadier General and placed in command of all British forces in the southern colonies. Henry Louis Bouquet died in Pensacola, 
West Florida on September 2nd, 1765, probably from yellow fever. Simon Gurdy was the principal interpreter at the signing of the Treaty of Fort Stanwix betwixt the Iroquois and the British in 1768. Now let's fast forward 10 years. So February 1778, you have Edward Hand, the commander of Fort Pitt, leading the disastrous Squaw Campaign, where Captain Pipe's brother Bull, his mother, and several of his red-skinned Native American children were killed while being all peaceful and neutral at their village. Simon Gurdy, who went with Edward Hand's Squaw Campaign, soon after returning to Fort Pitt, defected, deflected, to the British, along with fellow scouts Alexander McKee Elliott, to help the Northwestern tribes unite against the white Americans. On March 28, 1778, Alexander McKee, another Scots Irish loyalist, Matthew Elliott, and Simon Gurdy all deflected on the same night. Along with them was Robert Sir Flitt, McKee's cousin, a man named Higgins, an employee and two of McKee's black slaves. Seven men left McKee's house in Pittsburgh and absconded west into the Ohio country and towards the British stronghold in Detroit. A few hours later, a party of American soldiers arrived at the house to take McKee to the Pittsburgh prison. The seven deflectors stopped by Coshocton, the capital of the Lenape. Coshocton was founded by Chief Newcomer. Chief Newcomer is what the British people called him. But Chief Newcomer's Native American name was Nitawatwees. <laughs> Nitawatwees. 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 Four syllables. Nitawatwees. So Nitawatwees was a Lenape chief of the Turtle Sub tribe. Nita Watwee's name. Nita Watwee's name means skilled advisor. Nita Watwee's son was Bimino, aka John Kilbuck the first, and his son, Bimino's son, was G. Lelymond, John Kilbuck the second. So John Kilbuck the second, Gil or G. Lelymand is the grandson to Chief Newcomer, Nitawatwees. Coshocton is still a city and a county in Ohio today. The name Coshocton derives from the Lenape word Coshaxkink, where there is a river crossing and it's altered to Coshaxton or ferry or river crossing device. So, so <clears throat> So, Coshocton, which is a city and a county in Ohio today, originally was the capital city for the Lenape. The capital city, the name itself, actually comes from the Lenape word, Coshaxkink, or Coshaxton, which means ferry, river crossing, or where there is a river crossing, or a river crossing device. In his journal, Sundry's Traitor and Militia Captain William Trent on June 24th, 1763, wrote about meeting with dignitaries from the Lenape tribe when they met with Fort Pitt officials, and he warned them of great numbers of Indians coming to attack the fort and pleaded with them to leave the fort while there was still time. So, you have some members from the Lenape tribe coming to warn William Trent that there's a bunch of Native Americans on their way and they were warning them, giving them a heads up. The commander of the fort refused to abandon the fort. Instead, the British gave as gifts two blankets, one silk handkerchief and one linen from the smallpox hospital to two Lenape delegates after the parley. And the two warriors was a principal warrior named Turtle Heart and Malmalty. Malmalty. Malmalty, a chief. So you had Turtle Heart and Malmalty. The tainted gifts were, according to their inventory accounts, given to the Indian dignitaries to convey the smallpox to the Indians. Out of our regard to them, we gave them two blankets and a handkerchief out of the smallpox hospital. I hope it will have the desired effect. 
says William Trent. That came from William Trent's journal at Fort Pitt, June 24th, 1763. Turtle Heart or Turtle's Heart was a Lenape principal warrior and chief who lived during the French and Indian Wars and Pontiac's War. Turtle Heart and Lenape Chief Kilbuck represented the Lenape Nation at the Treaty of Fort Stanwix in 1768. Simon Gertie was a principal interpreter at the 1768 Treaty of Fort Stanwix. Turtle Heart was possibly the brother of Wolf Clan Chief Custaloga, aka Pancake. Custaloga is Pancake. So Turtle Heart was possibly the brother of Custaloga and perhaps the father or uncle of Captain Pipe. Our Captain Pipe, also called Konesh Qualohil. Konesh, Konesh. So Konesh Qualohil. Konesh Qualohil. Captain Pipe. Konesh Qualohil. Captain Pipe is also known as Hopakan. Turtle Heart was either Captain Pipe's father or his uncle. Probably an uncle, but one can never be too sure. And it was to Turtle Heart. Captain Pipe's uncle or father that William Trent gave small pox blankets to in June 24th, 1763. After the murders of Captain Pipe's mother and brother in 1778, the Lenape's loyalties were split in their alliances during the American Revolutionary War. While at Coshocton, Simon Gertie met his brother James Gertie, who joined Simon in his deflection. George Gertie eventually followed in his brother's footsteps and also deflected. A Pennsylvania court declared Simon Gertie, James Gertie, and George Gertie, along with Alexander McKee and Matthew Elliott, outlaws, guilty of treason, and placed an $800 bounty on Simon Gertie's head. Simon Gertie made a pledge for war. Captain Pipe of the Wolf Lenape clan agreed, but White Eyes of the Turtle Lenape clan disagreed. Wide Eyes wanted peace. Hopacan was ready to act, but Wide Eyes wanted to be more methodical. And so he called an Indian powwow to be held at Coshocton and requested that before any action be taken against the Americans that a picked committee to be sent to Fort Pitt for the mission of finding out about the threat of war. Captain Pipe and the members of his tribe who supported war departed from the Tuscarawas River, the Tuscarawas, Rawas, Rawas, Tuscarawas area and relocated to the Wahonding River, Wahonding River, about 15 miles above the present site of Coshocton, Ohio. The Lenape, stupid enough to be duped by the new white Continental Congress of the United States, stayed near Coshocton. On April 20th, 1778, Simon Gertie, along with Edward Hazel, a British Indian agent in Leather Lips, a Wyandot chief, reached Detroit, where Henry Hamilton, the hair buyer, employed Simon Gertie, paying him 16 shillings a day.